We have ignition. Today, got this older gas dryer in need of a tune-up. Might as well take y'all along for the ride. Shouldn't be super dirty in here since it did get a partial clean a few months back. This is about as simple as an automatic dryer can get. Bare minimum electromechanical controls with two temp settings plus a no heat air fluff option. Automatic modes only available on high heat. I'll get to why later in the video. I'll set up the extension cord now. Always completely unwrap extension cords even if you don't need the full length to prevent them overheating. Trusty kilowatt to measure current. Dryer fires right up, but does sound a little bit rough. Current varies as a hot surface igniter cycles. Obviously no gas hooked up, so burner can't light, and it will continuously retry as long as it's running. Despite its age, it still moves plenty of air. Alright, teardown time. Unplug before opening, warning stickers are not just for show. Got it up on my mechanics creeper so I can take advantage of the overcast sky giving some good lighting today. First, need to take the access cover off the electronics bay. Six quarter inch hex head screws. Not a lot going on in here, but in need of a good cleaning. I expected the diagram to be secured, I guess. seeped in over the years, wet rag handles that, and the remaining dust, soap is still soap. Wiring diagram is well laid out, but always good to record how things were wired before tearing it apart. Got the cycle selector and timer as one combo unit, and the momentary button start switch on the other side. It's been a while since anybody's been up here, so all the connectors are very stiff. Though I prefer that over things vibrating apart. Lineman players to the rescue. More quarter inch hex screws hold the ground wires. Each main metal piece has a ground connection. Two clamps with larger 5 16 hex screws hold the lid on the machine at the back. I'll feed the wiring harness down now so it can't get snagged as the lid comes off. Lid screen has to come out next. Two Phillips head screws hold the lid to the lint screen holder and drum outlet duct. The front of the lid simply clips onto the body of the machine. Had to use a little bit of prying action to get this one side to come loose. Whole lid then tips up, slides back, and lifts away. Can now see the outlet duct where the lint screen goes, the wire harness with another ground point for the main chassis, and the top of the drum with its belt. There's some wear and tear on this belt. It's not failed, but it's coming due for a replacement. Next, the front panel has to come off. The door switch lives down there, so have to undo that connector first. Two 5 16 screws hold this front panel on, one in each upper corner. Front panel hooks at the bottom, but this one was a bit stuck, so had to coax it a bit. Should simply pivot out at the top, then lift up. Drum is supported by the front panel here, so it will sag as the panel's removed. On the lower left can see the gas valve and burner assembly, and lower right can see the motor and belt tensioner. If I turn the drum a bit by hand, you can see the idler and the motor turn. It's very tough to get a camera shot of this, but I'm pushing the tensioner away from the drum to take tension off the belt, and then slide it off the idler and the motor pulleys. The tensioner is held by the spring action, so it wants to fall over once the belt's off. Now can slide the old belt off the front. Before I toss anything, gonna open the package and make sure the new belt matches dimensions. Obviously, the old belt stretched a bit over time. Part numbers and overall size match up, and to my great surprise, the new one is also made in the USA. Close-up reveals cracking and wear on the ribs of the old belt. Definitely time for a new one, even if it hasn't snapped in half yet. If I were simply replacing a bad belt, I'd stop at this point and begin reassembly, but there's more tune-up steps I want to do while I'm in here. The drum lifts up at the back to free it from the support rollers, then slides forward and out. 
can now get a closer look at the motor. It's a squirrel cage induction motor with some extra components to fit the application. I'll pull up the wiring diagram here. Red will indicate current flow on the line side, and blue will indicate current flow on the neutral side. Black lines may have voltage present, but are not carrying current. When the momentary start button is pushed, it completes the neutral side of the circuit. Both start and run windings are energized at the same time. This gives the motor enough torque to spin up a heavy drum full of wet clothes. As the rotor approaches a good fraction of running RPM, force on these weights makes them pivot, forcing this ring to slide along the shaft and engage the hold switch. This disconnects the start winding while also latching the run winding circuit closed to allow the motor to stay running and provide a neutral path for the rest of the components. This is a safety feature that prevents other items from running if the motor stops or fails to start. The motor will run until power is interrupted by timer or the door switch, which also means the dryer will not restart by itself after a power failure. Moving on, the drum support rollers are in okay shape but are due for cleaning and some lube. This unit has two rollers, other designs may have more. I'll brush the loose hair and dust from the drum roller shaft, then carefully unclip the triangular retainer from its slot and remove the roller. Even more gross stuff behind here to take care of. A pre-moistened scrubbing towel is a convenient way to get the fine dust and any old lubricant off the shaft. Likewise for cleaning the bore of the roller. Greases or oils attract dust and present a fire risk. A silicone or graphite dry lubricant is best for the moving parts of a dryer. The solvent carrier evaporates quickly, leaving a thin dry film on the surfaces. Be careful not to get any on the belt pulleys below. Roller works much better now. So I'll snap the retainer back in place and move on to the lower roller. This one carries more weight, so it's supported by a strut. Need to get this heat shield out of the way first by taking off two 5 16 screws and sliding the tab out of the slot. Another 5 16 screw holds the strut to the bottom pan of the dryer. A press fit retainer holds it to the tip of the roller shaft. After that, the lower roller gets the same treatment as the upper one. Also a good opportunity to clean the surrounding areas. There's a small amount of corrosion and scoring on top of the shaft, a whole lot of miles in that roller. More silicone and the roller spinning freely again. The axle of the belt tensioner idler pulley can't be disassembled here, but I gave that some silicone too, and I used a paper towel to apply a small amount to the sliding surfaces where the drum will rest. Here's a closer look at the burner assembly. Gas valve is single stage with two physical coils, though the main coil has two windings. A hot surface glow igniter lights the gas, and an infrared flame sensor proves ignition. Here's the diagram again. When power is first applied, current flows through the closed flame sensor switch, bypassing the main valve coil. The igniter and assist coil are energized in parallel. The whole coil is always energized when there's power to the burner, but the hold and assist coils together are not enough to open the gas valve. As the igniter warms up and begins to glow, Heat radiating through the window causes the bimetallic contacts in the flame sensor to bend and open the circuit. This forces current to flow through the main coil before the assist coil and igniter. The hot igniter element presents higher resistance, causing more voltage drop across the assist coil at first to help open the valve. The combined magnetic force of all three coils together opens the gas valve and the burner lights as gas touches the glowing igniter. The infrared from the flame keeps the sensor element hot and the burner running. As the igniter cools back down, resistance decreases, effectively bypassing the assist coil to prevent it from overheating. The tiny current passing through the main coil is not enough to cause appreciable electric heating of the igniter. In case of ignition failure, or the flame going out, the flame sensor cools down and closes again, shutting off the gas valve and re-energizing the igniter. It will retry continuously until the flame is detected. But, if the igniter itself fails, there is no heat generated, so the gas valve will never open at all greatly reducing the risk of explosion from gas building up inside the dryer drum and vent. This is a venturi where combustion air is pulled in by the gas as it exits the orifice and passes through the specially designed tube. Here you see the orifice, a precisely machined opening designed to meter a specific rate of gas at constant pressure, typically 3.5 inches water column. A pressure regulator inside the gas valve ensures consistent performance as long as supply pressure is within range, typically 5.5 to 10.5 inches of water column. 
I'll carefully use a scrub and compressed gas duster to get any debris out of here to ensure correct burner performance. Then wipe the inside of the combustion chamber. The hot surface igniter is fragile and is self-cleaning when it heats up, so do not disturb unless prepared to replace it. Now moving to the back of the dryer. A bunch of quarter-inch hex head screws hold the rear panel in place. Intake and outlet ducts and the blower housing can be accessed here, along with thermostats and safety devices. Four quarter-inch screws hold the outlet duct to the blower housing. It swings out at the bottom, then slides down and out. Behind is the blower wheel and housing. Not terrible, but some caked on dust in here. Ideally, I'd want to remove the blower wheel entirely, but there is no place to hold it other than the plastic veins, and I'm hesitant for fear of breaking it. Age and long-term exposure to heat will have made it relatively fragile and very well seized to the motor shaft. In case of motor replacement, I would always order a new blower wheel as well to save that headache. Instead, I'll clean best I can with a plastic bristle brush and a vacuum. Takes a bit more time, but I can get the bulk of the crud out of here. Same deal with the exhaust duct, doesn't need to be spotless, simply not caked with years of dust and lint. Exit grill on the back wall of the drying chamber gets a brush treatment too. Unfortunately, the foam gasket has essentially crumpled to nothing. I'll take it all off, including the very baked adhesive backing. The outlet duct holds a lint screen and tends to collect both lint and heavier debris at the bottom over time. While not caked like the blower housing after the quick cleaning I did months ago, there's still some accumulation at the bottom. Now begins a reassembly. All done back here so it can put the outlet duct back on the blower housing. The destroyed gasket has left a gap that will cripple the dryer's efficiency. In absence of suitably temp-resistant foam gasket, I'll use this Nashua 324A foil tape. This is UL181A-P listed for joints on rigid ductwork. This part number is rated for an operating temperature of minus 25 to 325 degrees Fahrenheit. Standard so-called duct tape would not work for this application. This stuff is tricky to work with and razor sharp at the edges. Patience is key to avoid slice fingers. Trust me, I know from experience. I'll speed up the reassembly a bit with this wider angle shot. Trickiest part is getting the drum to settle in place and getting the belt back together. Following the picks, the diagrams and the labels, all the control wires go back where they came from on the timer and start switch. I'm leaving rear panels off for testing and demonstration. Normally, these should be installed before energizing any part of the dryer. Three, two, one, don't blow up. And that sounds like success. A quick bit of rearranging to access the gas supply in the garage here for a proper test. Would be embarrassing if the burner's in-op after all that work. Hand tighten to start threads on gas connectors, but always have wrenches right there so you can't forget to finish the job. No Teflon tape or pipe dope on the flare cedar threads. Use a backing wrench to avoid stressing the pipe. Connect the dryer side of the gas connector in the same way, turn on the gas cock, and wait at least five minutes while checking for leaks to give any a chance to manifest. While I'm waiting, I'll get the exhaust duct pointing the fumes away from the garage, and pop off this little burner inspection cover on the lower left of the front panel. My secondary camera should get a good view of the action in there. Power, timer, camera, and start.
We have ignition. This design uses the thermal behavior of the drying clothes to control the automatic drying without any special sensors or electronics. This snap disk thermostat senses the temp of the air leaving the dryer. In automatic mode, the timer motor is in parallel with the thermostat chain as shown here in the diagram, all of which is in series with the burner assembly. When temp is lower than set point, the thermostat switch is closed, bypassing the timer motor and sending full power to the burner, which ignites as I described earlier in the video and begins heating. Once the air reaches a cutout set point of about 170 degrees Fahrenheit, the thermostat opens. Burner shuts down, and current flows through the timer motor as the drum and contents cool down. At the cut-in set point, the thermostat closes and the burner fires back up, pausing the timer. The clever part is, the water in the damp clothes is heavy, and evaporation absorbs a lot of heat energy. Therefore, damp clothes heat up more slowly and cool down faster. The burner duty cycle is high, while the timer duty cycle is low. As the clothes dry out, they heat quicker and cool more slowly, causing less burner runtime and more timer runtime. The dryness setting simply changes the starting point of the timer, biasing it towards more or less of these heat cool cycles to control the ultimate dryness of the load. This is why the automatic function only works on the high heat setting for this model. The low heat cycles use a different set of contacts on the thermostat and would need additional components, as shown here in the dashed line optional parts in the diagram an independent temp selector, and a thermostat heater to provide biasing at lower exhaust temps. Alright, everything's looking good, so time to button it up. Old, but good to go for a while longer. Make sure to replace wiring diagrams and service manuals for the next person who could well be you. Thanks for watching everyone, as usual, check out the end card for more content that might interest you, hit that subscribe button if you haven't yet, and check out the social media links down below. See you next time!